Today we're discussing this thing, the iFootage Shark Slider Nano, which while not perfect, might be the best motion control device available for the money. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and it's all in the hips. It's all in the hips. All right, for starters, as always, some disclosure. iFootage sent me this slider free of charge to make this video, and they're also sponsoring a giveaway and a special discount for you if you use the code UNDONE at checkout. And just so you're fully aware, that link will be an affiliate link, and I will earn a commission if you make a purchase using it. The way the giveaway is gonna work is that anyone who orders using the code UNDONE will be entered into a draw, and one of you will get your slider for free. The winner will be chosen at random and not by me, and the logistics will be handled by iFootage, and that winner will have their purchase fully refunded. Funded. But even if you don't win the giveaway and don't get your slider for free, iFootage has agreed to give you all a 10% discount regardless as long as you use the code UNDONE at checkout. The discount will end on January 1st, 2021, so if you're planning on buying one of these sliders, do it before the year's end. Okay, now let's actually talk about the slider. This is a two-axis bi-directional motorized slider, meaning you can program combination movements using up to 360 degrees of pan and slides that range from 20 centimeters on a table to 40 centimeters on a tripod because it does that you know, double the distance going over top of itself thing. The entire thing is solid metal, feels very well built, and comes in at just over two kilos or around four and a half pounds. Now, if you've been following my channel for a while, you might remember me talking about this thing back at NAB 2019. Since then, it's gone through several revisions to get to this final form, and apparently, it's finally ready to go to market. But let's put that to the test and see. I think when it comes to motion control, the most important aspect is usability. As I've complained about in videos in the past, if the system is a pain to use or unreliable in its user experience, it's gonna make you look stupid in front of clients and it'll likely just end up collecting dust. So I figured the best way to convey this aspect of the Nano would be to actually use it and talk you through what I like and don't like about that user experience. Okay, so first up, let's actually talk about powering this thing. So you may have noticed that there is a Sony L-series battery in the side here, and this one is an NPF 750, and this actually comes with the bundle version. I'll give you a breakdown of what comes in the standard of the bundle in a minute. But powering option wise, this might be the best slide I've ever seen for that. I know that some of you are always concerned when there's internal built-in batteries in the devices that what happens if it reaches too many charge cycles and then the battery dies, so you'd rather have replaceable batteries. But I also like the option to be able to run it continuously. And so what basically, it comes with a, well, you can get one with an L-series battery. If not, you can use any L-series battery. And on this side, it also has a USB-C port that you can see here. And this can be used not only to actively power the device even if you don't have a battery in it, but you can also charge your Sony L-series batteries using that USB port through power delivery. So that's pretty awesome. I think that's like the most modern and best combination of like older L-series batteries and new USB-C. So I'm a big fan of that. Now, like I said, I'll tell you about the kit option. So there is one kit option that comes with this battery and it comes in this case. So I've got a little breakdown here. So there's two different options. There's a the standard one, which is $499, and then the bundle, which is $599. The standard one comes with the slider. It comes with a USB-C uh, charging cable, USB-C to A, and it also comes with this smartphone mount. Then as far as the bundle is concerned, you get all those things, but you also get this carrying case, as well as one of the uh, L-series uh, F750 batteries. This is like the medium size Sony batteries. And you get a collection of different shutter release cables, which should work for Canon, Sony, Panasonic, Leica, Nikon, and Fujifilm. I'll put this up on the screen so you can see, but there's a huge number of camera models and they have the shutter cables for those. And then again, it all comes in the case. You don't get the case if you get just the standard $499 version though. But I think for that extra hundred bucks, that's a pretty good value to get all those things. And that's probably the one that I'd go for just because the Sony L-Series battery is a good value in the first place. All right, so let's put the battery in and get started. Now, before we turn it on, the first step is to make sure that your slide lock is disengaged. So it has this slide lock mechanism, which I don't find to be the, you have to kind of adjust it there, you just heard it, for it to actually click in. So you might think it's engaged, it's not. Like, put it on and then kind of adjust it, and then when you take it off, same thing. So turn it off, and then make sure it's free. And you have to have that free before you turn it on because it's part of the calibration process. The second thing is to make sure that the slider isn't wobbling itself, so see how mine's kind of wobbling. On this side, there's little feet adjustments for, you can raise and lower these little feet pegs. So I would just basically, and there's one on this side too, raise them up until it doesn't wobble anymore. And then there's also a carriage tension adjustment. There's this like belt gap adjustment. And if you take the carriage and it wiggles, this one isn't. 
but if it wiggles, then you see this red wheel here. You need to move it toward yourself to tighten it up and away from yourself to loosen it. It works well to tighten it down. Like it's nice and nice and firm now, but I do find this thing can be actually really hard to rotate and it kind of like wears down your thumbs, which can be a bit annoying. It's probably the only part of like the fit and finish of this that I wasn't in love with. I thought everything seems really well polished and really well built, but this thing felt a little bit rough and kind of hard to use. But once you set it, I think you're okay. They do say that if it changes temperatures drastically or something, you might have to adjust it again. But anyway, once you have all that stuff done, you should be good to turn it on and then it's gonna start the calibration process. The only other thing that I would say is maybe a little bit of a pain in the butt compared to some other devices that I've worked with, although those are usually thousands of dollars, is that to put it on your tripod, you basically just have to put it on and spin the thing in a circle, which can be kind of annoying. There is a solution though that iFootage offers, which are pretty great, and it's their C-Stars, which are these like quick release tripod mounts. So basically you would put one of these on here and tighten it down, and then you can pop things on and off the tripod. I'll demonstrate this when we do some of the tripod tests, but there is a workaround that iFootage offers, but these are extra cost optional. They don't come with it. Okay, so once you're all set up, you can power it on, and to do that, you just hold down the power button here until you see this white screen power up, and then just let it go. Again, make sure that it's completely unlocked, and then it will do a whole calibration process. Now this part is okay, but I do have some issues with it. It doesn't, it takes a little bit longer than I'd like, and the biggest problem with it is that you have to do it every single time you turn the slider on. I wish that if nothing changed, that either you could skip the process or that it would know, I guess, that nothing changed. Can you see here on the screen, it's going through the process, and it also lets you know to make sure that it's level. Now there is a bubble level, which is nice right here on the carriage. And so you can make sure that you're level that way. But it takes about, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds to a minute total to boot it up, which is fine, like I said, the first time. But if I just did a slide here and then I powered it down, went and grabbed lunch and then came back and turned it back on, I'd have to go through the whole process again. So I think that could be something that hopefully, I've heard that maybe they're gonna work on skipping that in firmware. All right, so the next step is to attach your camera and or head. Now I'm gonna attach the head to this one, but I wanted to sort of show you an angle here so that maybe you could see, I'm gonna actually flip it around this way. So you see this little lever here? When you go to attach something, to stop it from panning indefinitely, I'm gonna put the iFootage K5 head on here. So this is just gonna spin now in circles. So you press this little, switch in, push it up here, and then now it actually lets you tighten it down because it locks the pan from moving. Now there are some weight considerations, obviously, when it comes to any slider. Uh, this one, when you're using it flat on a tabletop like this, it's up to 3.5 kilos, which I think is pretty good. If you put it on a tripod, it's 2.5 kilos, and that's because it has to extend past itself. And, and then when you go vertical, it's two kilos. Now this is the A7S3 with the 35 millimeter 1.8 and a cage on it, and this was only like 1.8 two or three kilos, and then with this head, I'm still under two kilos, so I should be able to do pretty much anything I wanna do with this combination. And now, once you have the camera facing forward, if you look down here on the screen, it'll show you that, make sure that you have the camera facing you know, perpendicular at right angles of the slider, and then you press calibrated, and then that's it. So that's the longest, most tedious part of the setup, is that part. Once you actually go to use the slider, it is incredibly easy to use. So I'm gonna show you how to do that next. Okay, so there's two ways that you can control the slider. One is that you can use the touch screen and the function buttons here, which is the way that I prefer because I love using the device itself and not being required to use an app because I have found apps for motion control to be kind of, I don't know, finicky in the past. So, but I will say that the app for this one is actually really good. It connected really quickly with no problems with connecting and the controls are quite intuitive and that there's some features that are being added with firmware that are pretty exciting, like tracking and that kind of thing. But you can just use it as like a joystick. I'll probably cut to an overlay right now. I'm using the app so you can see it. Um, but normally I prefer not to use the apps. The best thing about the system is how fast and easy it is to operate. And just by using two buttons, really, you don't even have to use the touchscreen, but there is a touchscreen. So the best way that I found to use it was just to press both the power and the function button at the same time like this. And that kind of enters you into the keyframing mode. All right, so basically all you have to do is set up your first shot and then press the function button and that's your first keyframe. And then you just move it to the second keyframe that you want like this. And if you need to make any adjustments, go ahead now. I'm not gonna worry too much about the shot. This is a demonstration. And then you press function again and that's it. One place function, second place function. And then on the touch screen, you can control how long you want it to run for. So let's change the time to, let's say 20 seconds. And then you go back. And so now you have from A to B in 20 seconds. And you just press the play button here. And I shot set up. And you can choose whether you want it looping or not. So I'm gonna turn on looping. And you can choose whether you want to go from A to B or B to A. And then if you press play again, it returns you to your origin position. And 
you know, get set up to do it. Then you have an opportunity to press record on the camera and then you just press play again and then it goes through the motion. It'll be quiet so you can hear how loud it is when it moves. I would describe the sound if you can't hear it. Microphone is just right here, just out of frame. If you can't hear it, it kind of sounds like distant running water. It's not very loud at all, just kind of like a shh sound. It's pretty good. I don't think that it'd be much of a problem. And you can see now that it's looping and it's just going to continue through this movement like this until you stop it. When you do stop it, there's an exit button or I think you can press the play button again. I'll do that. And that stops it. I do have one small criticism here, which would be that I wish that when I did stop it, it would kind of ease into a stop instead of being like abrupt. But other than that, it works really well. Now, obviously, if you remember that I said that the bundle comes with shutter cables, there's obviously a couple other modes. If you press home, there's time lapse and stop motion. The quick start mode is the one where if you press both of the buttons at the same time, but there's a time lapse mode and a stop motion mode. Okay, I got the tripod set up here. This is the iFootage TC7 tripod, and I've got one of those C stars on top, so I'll show you how they work. But first, uh, I'm just gonna attach the, the tripod. So I'm going to move this into the middle and lock it down. And then conventionally, this is how you would have to do it. You would have to sort of twist and screw it on, which I've never loved this method because especially when it comes off, you have to be careful not to throw the, throw the slider on the ground. So there, once we got that nice and tight, the cool thing about the C-Stars is now if I wanted to take this off, you can just turn these things here and it's like a quick release and you can just pull it off and then, I don't know, put your head on instead. And then you just pop it in here and push down and then you lock back in place. So I'm just gonna do like a similar kind of parallax shot using the Rubik's Cube. So we'll move it. Now you can see that it can move all the way over here. So we'll set that as position one and it can obviously travel twice as far now over here to position two and we'll press play. It'll return to its original position and then I'll record and press play again. And so it's gonna be a 25 second full range slide. Again, I'll let you listen to it and I'll show you this, the shot on the screen while it happens. Okay, now let's talk about the vertical shots. But I'm also gonna take the other part of that C-Star thing I was talking about, and I'm gonna screw it in on the bottom, which is another 3 8 inch uh, mounting point. And then now we can release this and just pop it in vertically like that. So that is one thing where the C-Stars are pretty awesome for, is this kind of switching stuff around. So when it comes to doing vertical shots, obviously you wouldn't want to just mount the camera like this because it doesn't make any sense. So you're going to need something like this one. This is actually from a competing brand. This is a Edelkrone device, but I believe iFootage is going to make their own sort of L bracket. And then you're going to need to screw this in here. Okay, so I'm trying to get it work for the vertical slides. One thing I'm noticing though is that I think the two kilo weight might be a little bit on the I'm not so sure about that side. I think like one kilo is safe, a phone is definitely safe, but I've been trying to arrange this L bracket in a different way and with the camera, and I was only able to get it to work, I did a test and I was able to get it to work without the cage on and using a lighter bracket. But now that I'm trying to push closer to that two kilos, it's having a hard time fighting, I think the pan motor is too weak to fight against the weight. You'll see as it starts to go down now that it's not tilting up. It's not able to fight against the weight of this camera. And I'm not even using that long or heavy of a lens. See how it's not tilting? But if I give it a little bit of an assist, you see how now it corrects itself? So I want to say that you should definitely stay below 1.5 kilos for vertical. And hopefully the eye footage bracket is, you know, better designed to optimize this. Because I do think if, if it was a lighter bracket that maybe put the camera on the bottom and sat it back a little bit, that we'd be able to get a better result. But the current bracket that I have, I can't tweak all those things. But it does kind of work though. This is what it looks like. So overall, the user experience is pretty fantastic. But now let's talk about some of the aspects that hold the system back a little. First off, the biggest issue is there's this bug that exists in the current firmware that prevents proper looping motion. Currently with my pre-production firmware, if you program a looping slide, when the slider reaches all the way to the far side over here, just before it starts coming back, it does this weird little pan adjustment. This totally breaks the effect of a continuous loop and needs to be fixed ASAP. But good news, I actually received a message this morning informing me that the development team at iFootage found that problem and are fixing it in the firmware currently as I film this. So it should be resolved well before the units start to ship. 
The other issue I have is that this system isn't the best for macro video at longer focal lengths, or even just doing some tight shots with longer unstabilized lenses. I found that by the time I hit 70 millimeters, the tiny little micro movements in the slider really start to show up in the shot. Here, let me just give you a demonstration of that longer lens problem I'm talking about. So let's start with the Sigma 24 to 70, which is a pretty heavy lens, but it still keeps well under the weight, even this whole combo, when you are doing like a tabletop slide like this. I do find that these sort of micro vibration issues are more apparent on a tripod than they are on the tabletop. So, you know, your mileage may vary depending on your setup. So again, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a quick little balance here. So I'll loosen off the plate and I'll just try and get this. So it's not really tilting forward at all. And we'll lock that down and let me get a shot. So I'm gonna go all the way to 70 mils here. Nice and sharp, lock that down. Really simple little parallax shot here. So you can see just the small little vibrations and you can decide for yourself if they're what you'd be willing to live with and I'll show you in post how to clean them up. In Resolve, the translation stabilization does a really great job without any unwanted effects. And it's a quick process, so I don't think it holds this slider back too much. IBIS on the camera, however, is not the best choice here to remove those little hiccups because IBIS can introduce its own problems where the image looks like it's drifting a bit at the end of the movement as the IBIS catches up. So I'd say a little post stabilization is the best fix. Okay, I'm using autofocus for these just to make these faster so if you see the focus drift a little bit, oops. It is what it is. Uh, okay, so we're gonna press play. Again, I'll do a 25 second movement and I'm gonna loop it and let's go with that. And I'll press record on the camera once it hits its position. And I'll put this up on the screen so you can see. Just look for those little, little shakes back and forth and then I'll fix it using Resolve's translation stabilization afterwards. Okay, so that little drift that you saw there just before it started coming back, that's IBIS. That's why you don't wanna have IBIS on. So now I'm gonna turn IBIS off so we can see what it actually looks like. So we can see any of the little shakes that might actually be there with IBIS off. So that's what we're watching now. So is it any better or any worse than it was with IBIS just on? You be the judge. And when we get to the end, you're not gonna see that weird IBIS drift anymore, but you might see that pan bug that I was talking about. So let's wait till we get to the end of the slide here. Okay, so it reached the end, now watch it, pan, and then it starts coming back. So that's not IBIS, that was the pan. So that's the difference between the IBIS drift and the pan bug. They gotta fix that, because other than that, I really like how it eases in at the end of the slide and eases back up. It's a very nice movement, just gotta fix that little pan bug. But again, I got reassurance that it's, they're working on it right now and it'll be fixed in the next firmware before they ever ship the final product, so. Okay, so the 90 millimeter macro is actually a lighter lens than the 24 to 70, but it's a tighter shot, so. Oh yeah, is it ever. So we're not gonna see the stabilized version just completely unstabilized with the macro, okay? I switched to manual focus on this one because I found with autofocus, you were seeing a bit of breathing and stuff and that might be distracting when you're trying to see how stable it is. So I might go out of focus a little bit as we get across the center point there, but just only look at the stability of the shot. And again, I'll probably put something up where I swipe afterwards to the stabilized version and resolve if I found that I found some noticeable shakes here. We still have that problem with Sony and with some other brands, I think the new Canon cameras too, where you can't switch the IBIS off on the body and leave it on in the lens. It's really frustrating, they need to fix that thing. So if I turn it off on the lens, it turns it off everywhere, unfortunately. If this was a big motion control system that cost several thousand dollars, I'd be a lot more critical of this aspect, but because this is a very small and significantly cheaper system, I'm willing to mostly forgive this. So if I had to summarize the actual performance of the slider, I'd say it's a great option for anything wide and would be a great compact solution for interviews or for establishing movements with a wider view, but it will require some post stabilization at times if you wanna use it for any tight detail work. But that might still be a favorable trade-off versus buying something that costs eight times as much. The thing I'm most impressed by though is just the simplicity of the programming. It seems so obvious, yet no one has ever done this elegantly before. Just move the camera and press a button on the actual slider Move it again, press the button again, press start, and you're off. Overall, very good effort. I wish it was perfect, but few things in life are, but it's a device I can definitely recommend for the use cases I mentioned. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. All right, I'm done. <laughs>